Joining us now on the line is Byron York from the Washington Examiner uh, and a, a guy who covers uh, politics and what's going on in this town. How are you this morning, Byron? Good morning, Brian. Doing well. Well, listen, I want to start with this soundbite. We haven't really talked about it this morning. Something that the majority leader of the Senate, Harry Reid, said yesterday. He's talking about Obamacare. Listen to the, this, this soundbite. You're just not going to believe it. And across the country, Americans who were once denied insurance because they suffered from something like cancer or as simple as acne were able to buy affordable quality health insurance they could afford and they could trust. But despite all that good news, there's plenty of horror stories being told. All of them are untrue, but they're being told all over America. Despite all the good news, he says, there are plenty of horror stories being talked about when it comes to Obamacare, and he says every single one of them are untrue. That, yeah, what can you say? That's a jaw dropper. I mean, <laughs> we, we know. We know the supporters, the advocates of Obamacare have now admitted in the last several months that there are many, quote, trade-offs on Obamacare. Well, trade-offs mean some people are helped and some people are hurt. Really interesting poll came out yesterday from the Kaiser Family Foundation, which is a, a group that's basically pro-Obamacare. And they asked, well, have you been affected in your life by this? And still, the large majority of people say they have not been affected. But the number of people who said they've been negatively affected by Obamacare is 29 percent. And the number of people who say they've been positively helped by Obamacare is 17 percent. Now, Harry Reid is saying there's 29 percent of the people so far just don't exist. Uh, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling. Uh, Byron, you wrote really well yesterday about this Eric Holder issue. I want you to expand on it. And, and it's this issue with the attorneys general not actually uh, 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 defending these same-sex marriage laws. Of course, we just saw the, the drama down in Arizona with the, the veto by Governor Jan Brewer yesterday. But same-sex marriage laws in Texas yesterday were overturned. They continue to be overturned in Virginia. Uh, a few weeks ago it was overturned. And what do you make of the attorney general telling attorneys general across the country that they don't have to defend laws that they don't agree with? Well, this was another jaw-dropper. That the, the, the National Attorneys General Association was meeting here in Washington, Eric Holder addressed them, and he did indeed tell them that as far as the state laws or state constitutions that define marriage as one man and one woman, if they're under legal attack, the, the attorney generals don't have to defend them. So who defends a state constitution? Well, that is, you know, this is interesting. There was all this press here, and Holder makes his big speech, and then after the speech, Holder leaves, and they clear all the press out, so no, there's no reporters in. Then Holder comes back in and says, okay, I'll take some questions now. And one attorney general, amazingly enough, from Arizona, uh, gets up and says, well, wait a minute, we have this adversarial system. We have the two sides argue the case in front of a judge, and then the judge decides, and then everybody abides by that decision. And what you're saying is that one side just shouldn't show up. I mean, how's that going to work? And Eric Holder actually conceded that somebody needed to defend uh, gay marriage bans uh, in court and perhaps suggested that, uh, that attorney generals could hire private lawyers to do it for them. <laughs> but, but basically the attorney general, I mean, we, we know where the gay marriage issue seems to be going. A lot of federal courts, district courts have declared state laws right. unconstitutional. We've had some state supreme courts and even a few legislatures uh, legalize gay marriage. So it seems to be going in one direction, but there hasn't been this big Supreme Court decision. There's no national uh, law, law of the land on this. But Eric Holder has decided that there already is. And since he says it's unconstitutional, he tells these state attorney generals that they don't have to defend it. In the Commonwealth of Virginia, for example, it became part of the Constitution because the people wanted it on the Yeah, the a solid majority uh, voted yeah. for it. And by the way, the judge in Norfolk, the federal district judge who overturned that, at least stayed her decision. Yeah. She said, okay, this, this is unconstitutional, but I'm not going to declare gay marriage legal yeah. in Virginia now. Which, and you know, we've seen in other states that causes yeah. lots of people to, to run to the courthouse to get married, and it creates extremely complex situations as the case goes through its appeal. 
she doesn't do that. She stays the decision until some higher court, all the way, it's got to go all the way to the Supreme Court at some point, uh, makes a decision. But, but the Attorney General Holder has, to, has already made his decision. Yeah, well, and the same thing happened in Texas yesterday. Same, right. very same thing. Okay, look. We're all coming from that Supreme Court case, right. the Windsor case, the right. Doma case, right. in which uh, the Supreme Court knocked down a federal definition, and so all the, the, the district courts in the states are saying, well, gee, if that's the case federally, then this state law is unconstitutional, too. Byron, I want to salute you. I want I want to tell you oh, that, I, that I really loved your reporting on this FCC controversy, this FCC secret plan to go into newsroom and query journalists about the way that they do their jobs. I mean, your, your reporting on that was stellar. I mean, now they say, well, it's on hold. And some people are saying, well, maybe that's not good enough. Maybe the FCC needs to decide that this was just a horrible idea and just kill this project all altogether. Not going to happen, I think, because of the, the influence of uh, Democrats on the FCC. And, of course, there's a Democratic president, so there's uh, a majority of the FCC. Well, what are uh, they trying Democrats. to do there in your mind? What is the real goal of that well, whole idea? The, it, you look down below this and down below this, and the idea is there's, there's always a goal of, of wanting to lessen the influence of conservatives, especially in radio. But on basically Rush Limbaugh and Fox, the continued success of Rush Limbaugh and Fox, I think, is kind of a thorn in the side of so many progressives and Democrats. And so they, the old fairness doctrine, they had hoped to maybe be able to revive that. And that's yeah. just blatantly that's not, unconstitutional. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. And they understand that. So now they've sought for more diversity ownership in, uh, in uh, media because they have done a number of studies that say, well, stations that are owned by big chains are more likely to run conservative radio hosts. And stations that are owned by independents or smaller groups or by women and minorities are less likely to run conservative uh, talk show hosts. So their idea is to encourage more minority ownership through a variety of, uh, of uh, public policies, for example, tax breaks when uh, a qualified minority purchases a station, something like that. So they're, they're pushing on that. And this whole survey uh, was to determine that uh, media outlets were not meeting what were called the critical needs of, of all the people, and therefore their ownership should be reconsidered. In other words, the survey had a predetermined outcome. I believe the yeah. survey was going to find that, that not all those needs were being met, yes. <laughs> There's a shock. Byron York, Washington Examiner, it's always so good to have you. Great to be here, guys. Thanks. All right, thank you.